Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Who's excited to be here? I am too. OK. Um, first off, does everybody have a handout? There is a handout for this session. If you don't, feel free to just give me a hand, and I'll make sure that you get one. They are not in the binder. I was not on the ball. I didn't get to it. So who needs one? OK, Mike's going to um, take care of those. Thank you very much. And I have some more if we need them. And inevitably, we'll have some people wandering in um, since this is the first one off the docket. OK, how many of you are producers? OK, how many of you are homeowners? OK, how many of you grow fruits or vegetables of some kind? How many of you are concerned or interested in pollinators or beneficial insects and what kind of a role they're playing in the production of those? Great. OK, we're going to talk about some of those today. So what are beneficial insects? By the way, this is all in your handout. So I, that's, that's on purpose. I didn't want people to have to be sitting there going like this, all right? So everything you see here is in the handout. Um, they're in our natural enemies, right? They prey on our insect pests. That helps us out. They can be arthropods. They can be insects or mites, nematodes, microscopic roundworms that live in the soil. Um, they can prey on weeds which can help us out, right? Animals that eat plants. Um, they could be pollinators. They can help us to pollinate our garden, to pollinate food crops and fl flowering plants. Um, under pollinators, they could be native. We've got lots of native pollinators, all kinds of stuff. Bees, beetles, bats, birds, butterflies, mobs, wasps, flies, ants. Sometimes ants even pollinate too. Or they could be non-native. How many of you knew that the European honeybee, the honeybee that we use for most of our pollination of commercial food crops, was not native to North America? It came from Europe, right? Um, or maybe they're just decomposers. Maybe they help us to break down organic matter in the soil. So a lot of different types of beneficial insects. But what are natural enemies? Natural enemies are insects that are out there to kill the prey, right? They're looking for their food source. Or maybe they decrease the reproductive potential of whatever their host is. And otherwise, reduce the numbers, and that's the key. Reduce the numbers of whatever that organism is. Not eliminate. Not get rid of. Reduce. Bring that number down. They can do this through predation. So they feed and kill on the prey. This is a, a, a predator kills at least two in its lifetime. They could be doing this through parasitism, where they live and feed in or on the host. So they have one host. And usually this is a, um, an adult coming along and placing an egg inside that host. And as that egg matures and develops, then it feeds and it, and it lives off of that host. Herbivory are, plant, are um, animals that feed on plants. We'll talk about that in a minute. It could be competition. They have a superior ability to obtain some sort of a vital resource. Maybe it's food, water, shelter, or light. And sometimes there's even this uh, secretion of substances that prohibit normal growth or function of other animals. OK, here's the key. And we'll keep coming back to this. Ways to attract beneficial insects. It's really simple. Plant diversity. You want to have a lot of different types of plants planted. Anybody know why? Why do you need different types of plants? Different bugs like different plants. And why would different bugs like different plants? The same reason we like different cars. What are those bugs going after? Food? What kind of food? What's their food source? Pollen? Protein? What else? Nectar? Sugars or carbohydrates? And then also sometimes other insects, protein again, right? 
So you want to have good plant diversity. Also, when we think of the different sizes or the different shapes of different types of beneficial insects, let's think of something like a hummingbird versus a beetle. They're going to be able to access flowers different ways, right? So you need that plant diversity. You need continuous blooms. And what I mean by continuous blooms is you really always want to have something in bloom. You want to plan for that. You want to have stuff blooming early spring, spring, late spring, early summer, summer, late summer, early fall, fall, late fall. You really want to plan to have those plants that are blooming in a continuous cycle. So there's always a convenient source of pollen and nectar around, okay? Varied flower shapes and sizes, quality of nectar and pollen. So what type of plants do you think I'm talking about when I say quality of nectar and pollen? What are some of the highest quality plants? Native plants. Go native when you can. Heavy in the natives. When we look at a lot of our ornamental plants that we buy in the nurseries, uh, they're bred for all kinds of things. They're bred for maybe great flower color, especially big bloom size. Maybe they're bred for a nice scent. Uh, maybe they're bred because they have a special sort of a variation that's sort of a, um, like a variegated different colors within the leaves. Typically, they're not bred for their quality pollen and nectar, right? So whenever you can, go native. Providing shelter, okay? Um, beneficial insects love a variety of prey, okay? And one thing that some people don't think of, access to water and mud. Some of these are using mud to help build their homes, okay? So having those sorts of resources available too. Sure, would that be good for everybody? Okay. So these are just some of them. You have them listed. All right, beetles, bugs, flies, lacewings, wasps, spiders, mites, birds, bats. Okay, what's this guy here? It's an earwig. Is that a beneficial? Is it a pest? <laughs> it depends on its numbers, right? Okay, so earwigs actually, um, they are a great beneficial for us. They do prey on a number of pests in the garden. But again, it's controlling those numbers. You don't want those, they become a pest if their populations get, get too big, okay? Anybody know the best way to control earwig populations? They reduce their habitat. Where are they hiding out, right? Find out where that is and get rid of that, whether it's a mulch pile, whether it's a wood pile, Figure out where that is and get rid of that. Okay, um, parasitism. We're going to go through these pretty quickly. Um, there's parasitic wasp up here. You can see this process of laying the poor little egg inside that. Oh, that poor little aphid, right? Doom and gloom right there. Or this caterpillar with all these eggs laid on. Um, this is actually a little parasitic wasp that has, has shown up on um, European honeybees. It's kind of interesting. This is fairly new. They're really looking into this. Um, this is actually a native pest for us. Um, it used to parasitize bumblebees, and it looks like it's jumping host now to the European honeybees. So another thing that we're kind of worried about with the honeybees, but parasitism. And uh, you have this link here if you're interested in this. This is the paper that you can look up for a little bit more, for a little bit more information on that. Okay, herbivory. Usually feed on the reproductive structures, the flowers, the seeds. Um, tamarisk beetles. Tamarisk beetles are feeding on what? Salt cedar. Okay, they defoliate. Um, came out of the eastern Mediter uh, Mediterranean tropic uh, areas, and uh, we actually brought it in to stabilize riverbanks. Oops, right? Did an awfully good job of that. Um, field bindweed mite is one that's being looked at. Anybody heard of this one? Okay. Um, it came from southern Europe, and um, what it does is it, it doesn't kill the plants outright, but it will thicken the leaves and distort them, distort the structure, um, so it weakens the plant. Um, now, mites love hot and dry, right? So a nice irrigated landscape probably aren't the best conditions for them. And then the puncture vine weevil down here, anybody heard of that one? Another one that's being looked at where actually the eggs are laid inside the burrs and then the larvae develops within the, within the seeds. So some of these different ones are looking, being looked at in terms of biocontrol. Competition, this is just dung beetles. 
assembling cow patties before the flies really get a chance to get in there and lay their eggs. And then, of course, you have things like allelopathy that's being looked at for you know, future weed control as well. OK, so let's talk about how we can uh, conserve and enhance pollinator habitat. So we talked about planting shelter and food plants. And I'm going to give you a great list of where you can find a bunch of those. Uh, reducing or eliminating use of pesticides toxic to beneficials, especially these broad spectrum insecticides, OK? Not these targeted insecticides, but these insecticides that are used to really kill a lot of different types of insects. Trying to eliminate that use is really important. And we'll talk about why here in just a second. And diversifying that planting. Here are some of the families that are good to look at. Carrot family, great family for beneficial insects, as well as the sunflower family. Again, you have all of these in your notes. Mustard family, it's a huge family. Really good thing. And a lot of what this is is that you look at, see how shallow these flowers are. It's really accessible to a lot of these beneficial insects. They can get in there and they can get the nectar and pollen. Um, these are some of the broad spectrums you want to stay away from, OK? This list here. Um, and then you have some of the active ingredients over here on the side. And just looking at one carbaryl, you know, what it controls over 100 species of insects on fruit forests, lawns, nuts, ornamental shade trees, and other crops. And what we find talking to the public a lot of times is people go, yes, that sounds perfect. That's exactly what I want, right? Well, it's also getting your beneficials as well, and you have to, in, in, your, in your pollinators. You have to kind of know that. Okay? These are your lethal dose 50s of some of your different types. You have all of that in your notes. So if, you're, if you need to go towards chemicals, um, you really want to try to minimize the need for spraying by utilizing what's called integrated pest management. How many of you have heard of integrated pest management before? Great, most of you. That's fantastic. Um, we're not really going to cover too much of that, but basically it's using a lot of different types of control tactics instead of just relying solely on your chemical control. So um, scouting, monitoring, cultural mechanical controls. Uh, you want to set damage thresholds. At what level do you need to come in and do you need to implement control? What's an acceptable level of damage? Because there always is going to be some, OK? Try to select the least toxic or pest-specific products first. You want to use timed and targeted sprays. What I mean by that is you want to target the most susceptible life stage of that insect. A lot of times that's when the insect is younger in its life stage. You really got to plan ahead and know when that susceptible life stage is. And that's when you want to target that control. Preserving your beneficial insects using broad spectrum insecticides only if needed. Managing resistance and rotating your mode of action so you're making sure you're not using the same chemical over and over and over again so we have that uh, more of that risk of building up resistance. Okay? These are some that are um, more targeted or tend to be less toxic. You have those in your notes. I'm not going to read them to you. You're welcome to review those. Those are some of the ones that you might want to think about substituting out for the broad spectrums. Insect resistance, OK. I've got an aphid problem. And maybe I have an aphid here that is resistant to the chemical that I'm getting ready to use. OK, so I do a spray. And what happens? I get a little more resistance. And what else happened here? I lost my ladybugs, my beneficials, right? And then I do another spray, same chemical, and I start building more of that resistance, and now my beneficials are gone. That's a problem. We can see why that's a problem, right? And that's what we're concerned about. OK, monoculture versus a diverse planting. So if you're this little bee, which field do you want to go to? Anybody know what this is? Actually, this is kind of a joke, but anybody know what this is? Tulips. Yeah, Holland. Isn't that pretty? OK, but how about this? Jessica, where is this? It's the Salt Lake County Jail Garden. They did a really nice job, you can see, of incorporating flowers throughout their, their rows. Or 
or even if we're just talking on a backyard level, right? And if we all had a million dollars, our vegetable garden would look like that, right? Okay, let's talk about a few of the ones. Um, how am I doing time-wise, Mike? Fantastic. Okay, that sounds great. Okay, so let's talk about a few of the ones that we're interested in. Lay swings. How many of you know about lay swings? Boy, this is one you should target. Uh, lay swings are voracious. You get this, uh, this stage here, this larval stage. Um, these are called aphid lions. They are just incredible eaters. In fact, they'll even feed on each other if they don't have another food source. So uh, this is what the eggs look like. Anybody ever seen this before? Yes, and I wondered what they were. And you wondered what those were. Those are lace wing eggs. Aren't those cool? So they're laid like this to, keep, to get them off the surface of the leaf, and that helps to protect that egg from, um, from another predator coming along and eating it have the larvae that develops here. And then this is what the adult looks like. And if you have lights on in the evening, um, you oftentimes see these guys, OK? Um, wonderful, wonderful um, predator for us. Attractive flowers, again, you have it in your handout. Carrot and sunflower families, buckwheat, corn are some of the ones that these guys especially like. Parasitoid wasps. Prey on all kinds of stuff. Aphids, armyworms, cabbage worms, coddly moth, hey, right? <laughs> Beetle larvae, flies, caterpillars, attractive flowers. Um, another thing, actually, that you may want to consider in a production uh, garden or farm is letting your herbs go to flower. If you're worried about seed spread, if you can keep on top of it, clipping those blooms after they're kind of done, before, that, before the seed matures, OK? But letting those herbs go to flower is a great way to, to attract a lot of beneficials. In my own garden at home, I always have plants that I just let go to flower. All herbs are there specific ones? There are some that are a little bit better than others. Um, dill, fennel, parsley, cilantro is a wonderful herb for beneficials. Uh, lavender, those are some examples of ones that maybe are a little bit better than others. Yep. Okay. Um, so you guys have all of this in your notes. I'm not going to read to you, but parasitoid wasps. Other wasps? Wasps are, a lot of wasps are predators. They're not like bees. They're not vegetarians. Bees collect pollen and nectar. Wasps are actually going out there and they're hunting down other insects, all right? A lot of them are. Ladybird beetle, we all know this one, right? Um, did you guys know what the different life cycle stages look like? This is the what? Larva. This is the pupa. And this is the adult, right? I love this picture. Look at this poor little aphid here. Ah! Doomed and gloomed. Really great predator. So if we need lady beetles, we should just go to our nursery and we should buy some, right? No, not the best idea. Why? Where do they collect lady beetles that you buy at the nurseries? Sevier, Nevada, the Sevier Nevada Mountains, high, high in the, very high in the elevations where they're conjugating, right? So typically when you bring them home and you release them, they fly and they leave. So you really should try to do what you can to bring the ones that are natively around you into your landscape. But if you see them, and especially if you see these different life cycles, uh, this is a good thing. Does it work to put soda on their wings? Like I have not heard anything about soda on their wings. Probably the way that I would sort of lean is more trying to coax them in. And if they have a food source there, then they're going to want to come in and they're going to want to they're going to want to stay around your landscape. So here are some of the different plants that work well with lady beetles. Okay, predaceous ground beetles, another one. These guys tend to feed on some larger stuff. They've got those big, strong mandibles, right? They can take on some larger prey. Slugs, snails, hey, right? Cutworms, all different sorts of things. Predaceous true bugs. What are some examples of predaceous true bugs? Anybody know? Assassin bugs. Assassin bugs. That's a great one. 
What else? Minute pirate beetles are a really great one. Okay? So these guys feed on a lot of different sorts of things. Definitely if you see these around the landscape. What else did I have? I have big eyed bug. Anybody ever seen a big eye bug before? You see there's a lot of turf actually. Okay? Big eyes on the side and then stout, kind of stout antenna. And I also have damsel bugs. Anybody heard of damsel bugs before? another good one in this group. Okay, predatory flies. Some flies are predators. Um, surfeit or hover flies. And sometimes, a lot of times, these guys can mimic bees. They look like bees, okay? Um, they have a little bit more of a um, kind of a stout abdomen. And if you ever see things coming down to the ground and kind of hovering right over the ground, Moving back and forth. Everybody, anybody ever seen that before? It looks like a tiny little bee. That's probably what you're looking at. Okay? These guys are good. Your mantids, of course, right? We love those. Those are awfully fun. Um, cosmos, brambles, permanent planting. Predatory thrips. How many of you knew thrips feed on thrips? Okay? Predatory mites. How many of you knew mites feed on mites? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I wouldn't think that they would be much bigger. They're about the same size. In fact, you can see a comparison here. I mean, your mites are, of course, something that you, you can see with the naked eye, but you really need some sort of a magnifying glass. I think if you were just trying to go out in the field and look for a size comparison <coughs> between the two, uh, yeah. And you're wondering what that was. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, and these guys are nice too because they require low populations to survive. Okay? Sure. And what so my what kind of conditions do mites like? Because we were talking actually about the um, yeah, we were talking about the field bindweed mite. What conditions do mites like? Dry and hot and anybody know the other one? Dusty. Yeah. Yep. Okay, some spiders are great predators. Um, we'll go through this really quickly. So let's just talk a little bit about pollinators. I really like pollinators a lot. Um, more than 85% of flowering plants require an animal, mostly insects, to move pollen. Um, and pollinators don't just move pollen for us. They're also a food source for wildlife. A lot of birds, a good portion of their diet, actually, that their protein is, is insects that they eat. Um, so important for wildlife, also aquatic life, um, and, um, and also food, force, food source for some of our beneficials, right, too. So butterflies, moths, flies, wasps, beetles are all types of pollinators. And you have all of this in your hand. I'm not going to read all this for you, but some of your favorite foods. We have our apples out there, of course, right? Our Utah apples. And that's one that we need the pollinators for. As well as our biodiversity of our flora, okay? All of our native species that we have up in our mountains. Some of these have very specific relationships with pollinators, okay? The perb. Uh, pollinators of uh, raspberry squashes, melons, and cucumbers. These are some of our natives, okay? We have over 900 species of native bees in Utah. So important bee management. Again, you have this in your handout. Hey, it's the same thing as beneficials, right? We're all coming back to the same thing. Natural habitat, floral abundance, near fields and farms, Diversity of plantings offer uh, varied and continuous blooms, maintain pesticide-free habitat when we can. Um, just realizing with native bees, you have different types. You have ground nesting. This is the majority of them, nesting in the ground. Wood nesting bees, nesting in twigs, sometimes the pith, open pith of stems, things like that. Uh, bumblebees nesting under tussles of grasses or sometimes underneath front porches, right? These are some of the ways that you can conserve some of those. Farm management considerations, identify and protect nest and forage sites, 
Avoid tilling when ground nesting bees are present. Choose a cover crop with a good pollen and nectar source. Allow crops to flower before tilling under. Protect or develop grass waterways. Create pesticide-free buffer zone. Develop, this is a really great one, develop hedgerows with buried of flowering shrubs that attract pollinators, things like elderberry, sumac, blackberry for wood nesting bees. Okay, and here for some of our plantings, we've talked about a lot of this with the succession of blooms. Native plants, um, plant masses at least three feet by three feet. A lot of these sorts of pollinators, like bumblebees, have terrible vision. They need billboards, okay? Big color blocks is what they're looking for. So grouping those plants together can really help them. Varying flower shapes and colors, at least 15 to 25 flower species, 45% flowering plants and shrubs, okay? Really the same basic concepts. Um, research has found locating these within a half mile, uh, locating your farm within a half mile of these areas can really increase pollination. So trying to develop those areas, to protect those areas if they already exist. Um, and again, planting diverse crops, interplant pollinator plants in border, in field or border plant in the periphery with pollinator plants or shrubs. Connect pollinator plantings in corridors whenever, whenever possible. And don't forget about things like structures like trees can be good habitat. Also some things like your willows. Willows are, are some of our earliest blooming plants in the springtime. Those are really important sources of pollen and nectar early in the year for pollinators. Okay, this is what I wanted to get to. You have this in your handout. If you want to know what these plants are, go here. This is a fantastic fact sheet. It's online. Gardening for native bees in Utah and beyond. Okay, definitely look that up and you should have that in your handout. And with that, I'm going to close. And um, just give my credits, if you're interested in a really good book that I find quite helpful, um, and I put, it's in your handout again, Natural Enemies Handbook by Mary Louise Flint. This is a really nice one, okay, you may want to have in your library. Also, I pulled some of this information from a um, YouTube video by Diane Alston. Some of you heard Diane yesterday. Um, attracting supporting beneficial insects in the landscape. So if you were to Google USU Extension YouTube, attracting beneficial insects, you could find that video and watch it for yourself online. So thank you very much, and any questions you may have? Yes? Yeah, I, it, it would be better to try to go with the pyrethrins when you can. Um, those um, pyrethroids, are considered to be more broad spectrum. Um, you're right, you only use them when you need to, but it, it probably would be better. And that is part of it too, is the residual. Yeah, for the, yep. large, for the larger ones. Yeah. Right well, in the whole concept of not, sorry, Mike, go ahead. Um, and then, you know, the whole caveat of, um, you know, read the label. Don't, yeah. don't kill with kindness. It, you know, don't overdo it application-wise or whatever. <laughs> Only use as much as what's directed on the label. So, yeah, some of these um, you have to be kind of careful. Even that's a really great point. I actually have a slide. I wish I had it in here. And um, if you'd like it, I can email it to you. Um, but it's it's important to realize that just because it is registered as maybe certified organic or it's considered to be an organic pesticide, it doesn't mean that it's not necessarily toxic to pollinators or bees. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yep. Are some of these natural pesticides uh, quick knockdowns so that you can spray them so that not? Yeah, if you're going to be, if, if you need to use these products, definitely timing is 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 a good consideration. Um, you, you're right, especially like the European honeybee is not flying at night. So if you were to do an application when, when it's, you know, they need the sun to orient themselves, they need the sun to find that direction, um, then it may be better to spray it at night when they're not out and about. Um, or, you know, monitoring when that crop is in bloom. There's actually, if you need to use um, pesticides, there's a really great fact sheet that I would really encourage you to use. I wish, again, I had it on here. You're welcome to email me and I'll send it to you. Um, reducing pesticide, um, 
toxicity to bees, I think. Do reducing pesticide toxicity to bees, USU fact sheet. And it will actually give you some tips, some really good tips as if you do need to use pesticides, how you can avoid, um, how you can reduce that chance of them um, causing issues with your bees. So I would suggest that you get on there and you check that out. Any other questions? Yes? Um, I think I <coughs> Is there a certain time of day that's better than others for looking for beneficials? Yeah, um, you know, the, yep, I mean, those, those sorts of things might be out there looking for pollen and nectar. They also might be looking at, looking for water around the landscape, um, you know, so, yeah, it's probably early, but really you, you can find, I've seen that nets before that were done in the middle of the afternoon and you can still find stuff. So, you know, you just kind of get out, get the out there when you can, but. I knew somebody was going to ask me that. <laughs> Greenhouses are not my forte. I did pull something off the internet this morning because I knew somebody was going to ask me that. I, Mike, have you used beneficials in your insect before? I know, in your greenhouse before, I know that lady beetles um, it's not that they're, they're going to do the best job. It's not that they're going to completely take away your problem. Um, but they will go through their different life cycle stages in the greenhouse. And so they're one that you could use. Have you, have you used any others? Yeah, and that's a really important thing to realize, too, about beneficials is they are following a food source, right? So you are going to see that increase of whatever that pest population is. And that's usually when people freak out. And that's usually when people go and they start reaching for the sprays and the chemicals. You need to kind of get up to having that population of that food source. And then the beneficials start coming in. So sometimes, too, it's just having a little bit of patience of, of letting that happen and seeing them following their food source in. So. Do we have time for more questions? OK, last question. Yes, sure. You could get similar benefits. I mean, you are trying to draw the beneficials into the garden, right? And, this, and those plants are providing a food and nectar source, which you could get from having the border and the periphery, right? Um, but then there's also the, the shelter that's involved. I think, you know, best case scenario is having them intermingled, but absolutely a lot of, a lot of production folks will have them on the border or will have the area that they have in production bordered by a more natural area. And there's really good research to show that that does, inc that does increase pollination visits in, into, the, into your production area. So yeah, I think if that's, I understand that on a, on, a, on a larger level, you might not necessarily be able to go and plant a bunch of flowers in the middle of your field. That definitely is the best follow-up option to that. Yeah, absolutely. 